So the book of Acts, we're stepping back into our study in chapter 8. We've seen as we've been going to this part of the book of Acts that there is a major persecution that's been going on in the church led by a religious extremist by the name of Saul. Saul's design for this persecution was simply this. Stop those Christ followers. Shut them up. Get rid of this religious heresy. And as he has been working in that direction, it has not stopped the persecution of the church. It has actually set the church free. The church has become more bold as it stepped into the surrounding regions of Judea and Samaria. And one of those Christ followers that had been dispersed, we met him. His name was Philip. Philip loved Jesus so much he said, there's persecution, it doesn't matter. I'm going to spread the gospel. So he left and went 40 miles north to a city called Samaria, which was pretty unique because the Jews hated the Samaritans. They had nothing to do with them. And you remember why, because the Samaritans were a mixed Jewish race. Thousands of years ago, they were part of the nation of Israel. They had been captured by the Assyrians. During that time in their capture, they intermarried with other people from other nations, which therefore did not keep their Jewish heritage pure. That was seen as an unforgivable sin. But Philip, who's a Christ follower, even though he has a pure Jewish heritage lineage, he didn't hold on to any of that hate. He didn't hold on to any of that history. And he says, I'm going to Samaria, and I'm going to talk to these people about Jesus. And when he did, God was working, wasn't he? The Bible says that men and women believed they were baptized. So many that the Bible says there was joy in that city. Woo! Amazing. God was working. People were coming to know Jesus. Lives were being changed. The city of Samaria was turning over because of the good news of Jesus. Well, today, we are going to go a little bit farther in our book, in our study, and we are going to meet someone from Ethiopia. And we're going to find out how the good news of Jesus made an impact in his life today. So hopefully you have your Bibles. You got them with you? Hold them up. Repeat after me. This is the Word of God. It's more powerful than a two-edged sword. And I love the Word of God. Father, we thank you again for your Word. Today, use your Word to take us farther and deeper in our walk with you. And may people forget my words, but only remember yours. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus, our Savior. All God's people said, Amen. 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 And amen. Man, take your Bibles, open up to Acts chapter 8. Again, if you're new to navigating in a Bible, in the front of a Bible is a table of contents. Use that table of contents. Find the Old Testament, New Testament. When you get to the New Testament, you go down to the book of Acts. Find that page number, turn there, and we are in chapter 8. Those are big numbers. Little numbers are the verses. We are in chapter 8. We're going to pick up today in verse 25. Verse 25. If you're there, say amen. amen. If you're not there, please wait for me. Bless you, Tom. Okay, everybody's there. Here we go. Verse 25, chapter 8, the book of Acts. And so when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem. You know who they is? Peter and John. Okay, Peter and John had come to Samaria to confirm what was going on. They are heading back. They were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to where? Gaza. Oh, I bet you guys know where that is, huh? Yeah. yeah. Parentheses, it says this is a desert 
road. And he arose and went. Behold, there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. And when Philip had run up, he heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you are reading? He said, well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation his judgment was taken away. Who shall relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, Please, please tell me of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of someone else? And Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. And as they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water! What prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop. They both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more, but he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus. As he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. Okay, let's unpack a little bit of what's going on here in Acts chapter 8. We pick up in verse 25, as we said, they, that's Peter and John, they had come down to Samaria from Jerusalem to see all that was happening because they heard so many people were coming to Jesus. They'd come to validate Philip's ministry, and it was amazing to see all that was going on as the gospel was being preached. But now that the gospel has reached into Samaria, it's time for it to go just a little bit farther. And in order to go farther, it has to reach out beyond. So we meet a person, a man from Ethiopia, a foreigner, a Gentile, representing the nations of the world. He comes onto the scene and God opens the door for Philip to meet up with this Ethiopian eunuch. You with me? You sound quiet. Some of you are sleeping. I can see you already. Okay. So if someone's sleeping next to you, give them a little punch, boom, wake up, I'm glad you're here. So here's an Ethiopian eunuch. When we talk about Ethiopia, most of us think of it as the country in North Africa. During this time in history, Ethiopia was a large, massive landmass with much of what we know of as Northern Africa. Ethiopia included Libya, Chad, Algeria, Sudan, and many other of those countries in northern Africa. At this point in history, Ethiopia was a massive kingdom. You can kind of get a picture of that from the map in front of you. Now, the king of Ethiopia at this time was considered almost a god. A divine being. They considered him a child of the sun. And because he was looked at in such a way, he wasn't allowed to do any work. No work. He could just sit around, relax, take care of him and whatever else you wanted to. No work in the kingdom. He was too sacred to do that. 
So history tells us that according to what went on in this society, that his mother, the queen mother, took care of all the royal duties of the kingdom. So the queen, the mother, is basically taking care of all the Ethiopian kingdom at this point in time. And this man that we meet, this Ethiopian, he was doing the work of the queen mother. Now, as we meet this man, he is introduced as an Ethiopian eunuch. Now, we had a question that came up in our Bible study because we were studying and this word came up and somebody said, hey, what's a eunuch? Well, important for us to know that a eunuch is a man who has undergone a surgical procedure called castration. This was very common at this point in time in history because men who would want a high position in the kingdom would undergo this surgery so that they could take care of the harems of those that were in leadership. So this was common for someone who wanted to pay the price for a high position politically. So we meet this man, an Ethiopian eunuch. This man is working for the queen, doing the work of the kingdom. But he is not just a eunuch among eunuchs. We meet this man and we find out that he is the official who is responsible for the treasury of Ethiopia. He is the chief financial officer of everything that goes on within this massive kingdom. So he's got to be respected. He's very powerful and honored. The Bible tells us that this man <coughs> has come to Jerusalem to worship. To worship. Well, Jerusalem isn't a quick trip. Jerusalem from the closest borders is about 1,200 miles. So, back at this time in history, there's no planes, no trains, and no automobiles. So if you are going to travel 1,200 miles, you've got to walk, be carrying, ride a camel, or a horse. It is not a quick trip around the block. But the Bible makes it clear that this man has traveled all the way from this massive kingdom of Ethiopia to his way to Jerusalem for one purpose. What was that purpose? Worship. To worship. Well, obviously, he's got some questions going on in his heart that he couldn't find the answers for in Ethiopia. So he has traveled this huge distance to get some very important questions answered. His heart's crying out. And he wants to know some important things about life and his future. So he makes this thousand mile trip. And it's here on this trip that this encounter begins to unfold. The Bible says that an angel of the Lord came to Philip and said, Philip, I want you to get up and go to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. Do you know what that is on the map today? You've probably seen it a lot as you hear the reports, because Israel has just stepped into its ground offensive in Gaza, because some bad things have been going on in Gaza. But not today. As Philip is on his road down to Gaza, something amazing is going to happen. The Philip, the Spirit said to Philip, get up, go and join this man's chariot. Okay, let's push the pause button for a minute. I want us all to catch what has happened. We just read this encounter, didn't we? We know from what we read that this is a very well designed and planned encounter. This is not accidental, is it? Philip just doesn't go, hey, I think I should travel down this desert road to Gaza one day. No, 
He travels there. Why? Because the angel of the Lord tells him to go there. And this encounter is with a man from Ethiopia. This is a planned encounter that God has made. That clear? Now that's important for us to understand because I want you to understand something very clearly. Salvation is God's work. Let that sink in. Salvation is God's work. It's not man's work. Man does just not one day go, hey, I'm going down this road to Gaza. I'm on this trip. I think I need to know about God. and I want to know who Jesus is. Man does not do that. The Bible says that man does not seek God on his own. We know why. Because the Bible tells us that man is dead in his trespasses and sins. Natural man is dead to God. There's no stimulus that comes to him that he goes, yeah, I'm going to learn about God because he's dead. In fact, the Bible says that he is what? Blinded. Blinded. He can't even see or understand. That's beyond his capability. So in order for a man or a woman in their natural state to have any kind of interest in who God is and salvation, God must take off the blinders of their eyes. Does that make sense? Yes. I want you to read a verse. Take your Bible. Turn to the book of John. John chapter 6. Just a few pages to your left. John chapter 6, verse 44. <laughs> Jesus is speaking here. John 6, 44. If this isn't a verse that's not underlined in your Bible, now's a good time to underline it. Jesus says this, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me does what? Draws him. It's very clear, God makes it very clear that salvation is not something that man does. Salvation is something that comes from God. A person in their natural state has no interest in who God is. You may know that. You may have sensed that because you may have talked to people and you're talking to them about Jesus. And they're like, eh, what? That doesn't make sense. I don't believe that. I don't understand that. That, that doesn't ring with me. Well, why? Because they're blinded. Without God taking off the blinders, they are incapable of receiving any good news about salvation? Well, in this situation, we know that God is working in this situation. Because God speaks to Philip, tells him to go directly to this man for the sake of the gospel. God is working behind the scenes. It's graphically laid out here, isn't it? This is a divine encounter. Now, I want you to understand something, that God is working behind the scenes, not only here, but in your life and my life. Did you catch that? God is working behind the scenes, not only here, but in your life and my life. Now, in our life, we usually don't see that. We can't sense that. We just follow along and do what we do in our life. But in reality, God is working, isn't he? Now, we see that graphically laid out in this scenario here. God puts it in his word so that we can understand that this is how salvation works. God works behind the scene. This is a divine encounter put together by God himself. Philip didn't know it was a divine encounter. All he knew was that God had told him to get on the road and go. Philip obeys. 
and the encounter begins. You know the same thing is true today? God is working behind the scenes in your life and my life. And you know what the object is? Just listen and obey. I'm going to share with you something that happened in my life a number of years ago. That as I was reading this, I was reminded of. I was fairly young, married, a couple of children, and I was driving on a nice sunny day in my Pontiac Trans Am with the T-tops off <laughs> on my way to a sporting goods store to get some tennis shoes. And on my way, as I drove down the road, I happened to glance over to my left, and there was a man sitting on a picnic bench, a picnic table, in front of one of these hotels where people can stay for like a day or a week or a month type of thing. And I happened to glance over there. As I continued down my journey, very clearly I heard God the Holy Spirit <coughs> say to me, Kim, stop and go talk to this man about Jesus. I said, what? I'm not going to go talk to this guy about Jesus. He doesn't even know who I am. So I continued on my road in my Pontiac Trans Am, listening to the music on my way to buy my tennis shoes. But God said, Kim, I want you to stop and go talk to this man about Jesus. Well, I battled with God for a number of miles. <laughs> and finally I said, all right, all right, I'm going to obey you. So I turned my car around and continued to head in this direction backwards. All the way going, this is one of the most stupid things that I have ever done in my entire life. What in the world am I going to say to this man? I have no idea, but I said I'm going to obey God. Well, as I drove, I saw him and I drove past him. And I turned into the hotel parking lot next to him, got out of my car, and all the time I'm going, I can't believe I'm doing this. I really can't. So as I came up behind this man, I startled him. He kind of went, whoa. And I said, whoa, sorry about that. I said, this is the most stupid thing I've ever done in my life, but I'm going to tell you, I was driving down the road, going to the store to get some tennis shoes, and God said, stop and talk to you about Jesus. This man turned around, and he began to cry. And he said, I was just praying to God, if you are really real, please make yourself known to me right now. <laughs> When that happened, goosebumps went up and down my spine. I shared the gospel with this man sitting down on that bench, and he prayed and asked Jesus to be his Savior on the spot. Mm -hmm. Woo! I was reminded of that when I listened to this story. And I said, wow, God, you do do those things, don't you? Not only back then with Philip, but you used me a foolish little guy on his way to the store to buy his tennis shoes. Because here's the key for all of us in this room. You never know when and where you might be when God will say, Michael, <coughs> Cleo, Sergey, Robert, Heather, stop and talk to that person about Jesus. Now I'm going to say I would probably guess that many of us in this room have heard that voice from the Holy Spirit. And I would venture to say that many people in this room like myself have said I'm stopping to talk to nobody about Jesus because i got to go buy my tennis shoes. Just think, what if Philip would have said, you know what, God? I've been busting my buns in Samaria, teaching people about Jesus. I ain't going on this desert road 
to talk to, to do whatever you want. What if he would have said that? Maybe there had been no story about an Ethiopian eunuch in the Bible. But you know what Philip did? He said, I'm going to listen. And God had a very amazing supernatural encounter that he had prepared so that when Philip came up to meet the chariot, <coughs> this man was reading a portion of scripture. It actually comes from the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53, which speaks about the Messiah, the spotless Lamb of God. Isn't that amazing that this man was accidentally reading? Accidentally. Oh, he wasn't accidentally reading Isaiah 53. And as he's reading this, he says to Philip, Philip, what in the world is going on here? I don't understand this. I need someone to guide me. And the Bible says that Philip preached Jesus to him. That's all he did. Was he preached Jesus. You know the Bible says to each and every one of us that we need to be ready to give an answer to those who ask the hope that's within us at any time with grace and mercy. In other words, that means preach Jesus. Not church. Don't invite people to church. Not that I don't mind people coming to church. But it's not about inviting people to church. Hey, I invited someone to church this week when the Holy Spirit said talk to them about Jesus. And the Holy Spirit's going, anybody home? It's not about church. Church doesn't get people to heaven. Religion doesn't get people to heaven. This man from Ethiopia is searching for an answer. He'd come all the way to Jerusalem to find out an answer for his heart. God prepared an encounter on the desert road to Gaza. Philip obeys. He meets the man in the chariot. He says, what's the answer? Philip says, the answer is Jesus. Jesus. <clears throat> the answer is Jesus. Woo! That's the same for everybody you and I meet today. The answer is Jesus. It's not government. It's not religion. It's not money. It's not power. The answer is Jesus. Well, the Bible says that this man comes to know Jesus. Philip's riding in the chariot as he's driving on this desert road. What kind of road? Desert, desert road. He sees what? Are you kidding me? Water on a desert road? God says, don't worry, this is a planned encounter. This is all happening because I have ordained this before the foundation of the earth, that this man's name was written in the book of life. I've been working behind the scenes. He is looking for an answer. Philip is my servant. Philip, head out on the road. Okay, God, I'll do what you want me to do, whatever that is. Hey, go meet this guy in the chariot. You want me to run up there and talk to him? Yeah, run up and talk to him. Hey, can you help me out with this scripture? You bet. It's talking about Jesus. He comes to know Jesus. They're driving down the road. He goes, hey, there's water. Can I get baptized? So the Bible says that Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch got out of the chariot, and Philip got a little water and sprinkled him and said, now you're back. No, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says they got into the water. And the word is baptizo, to immerse. He immersed him in the water, baptized him. Now, obviously, Peter had talked to him, or excuse me, Philip had talked to him about baptism as he talked to him about salvation. And God says, yeah, that's important. Baptism is an outward sign of an inward belief. It's how a Christ follower proclaims to the world that they are a follower of Jesus. Now, this is a little bit twilight zone as we finish <laughs> up this chapter. Because the Bible says, at the end of this chapter, are you there in Acts or are you still in John? Acts chapter 8. Listen to what happens at the end of this chapter. And when they came up out of the water, 
which tells you they weren't getting sprinkled. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more. First of all, I want you to see what happened with the eunuch. He went on his way, the Bible says, and he went on his way what? Rejoicing. Rejoicing! I came all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to worship, and God answered my prayer. I found Jesus, and he goes back rejoicing where? Rejoicing. To Ethiopia, this massive kingdom in northern Africa, and the Bible is being fulfilled right before his eyes, because Jesus said, you're going to be my witnesses. Jerusalem? A little persecution? Oh! Get out of Jerusalem. Go to Judea, Samaria. And now, that witness goes to the remotest parts of the earth in northern Africa. God is working. Amen? Amen. In fact, God is working so much that that gospel came to Jackson, California, because you and I are sitting here today, and we have come to know Jesus, because God has taken the blinders off of our eyes, and we now have that good news to share that good news with someone that we might meet who's on their road looking for an answer because their heart is asking questions. Why is this going on in Israel? What's going on in the news? Why is this all happening? How does this affect me? Why is everybody so excited about this? Oh, guess who has the answer, Jenny? You have the answer. Renee has the answer. Michael has the answer. Barbara has the answer. Guess who has the answer? You have the answer. So you have the opportunity to preach Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 That's exactly where we have to be at this point in time in history. This is so important because... If everything is funneling to where we think it is, Jesus is coming back soon. And if he's coming back soon, guess what? Your boss, your employee, your friend, your neighbor, your tennis partner, if they don't know Jesus, they're going to be living through what the Bible says is the worst time on planet Earth as God's judgment and Satan's anger come together in one. Nobody wants to be there. And aren't you glad that as a Christ follower, for God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with Him. That's awesome, huh? That's awesome. So, the eunuch comes to know Jesus. The first Gentile outside of Jerusalem and Judea who comes to know Jesus and is baptized and now takes the gospel back to Ethiopia to the king's mother and eventually to the king. God is working. But we don't want to forget Philip because what happened here at the end is almost like twilight zone. The Bible says that they came up out of the water and God snatched Philip away. Poosh! He's gone. Beat me up, Scotty. There he travels to another part, which is north of Gaza, from where they were. And the Bible says God puts him exactly where he wants him to be. Philip goes, wait, I was just there with this guy, and now I'm here. What am I going to do? Guess what he did? He preached the gospel all the way up the coast, the Bible says, until he got to Caesarea. You know what God wants for you, for me? He's got us in the right place at the right time right now in Amador County. And you know what he wants you to do? Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel on your way to work. Preach the gospel on your way home. Preach the gospel in your neighborhood. Talk to people about Jesus. Have a neighborhood barbecue. Pray for the people in your neighborhood. Let people know there's open Jesus. Talk to the people that you work with. Talk to the lady at the Ace Hardware store. Talk to the lady that's at Lowe's Hardware. 
talk to the person you play tennis with. Whoever it is, talk to them about Jesus. Because Christ followers, now is the time for salvation. And aren't you glad that you love Jesus? Aren't you glad that God has taken the blindness off your eyes? Amen? Amen. And that no matter what happens, you're on your way to heaven one day. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. But that's the good news. That's the penicillin that you and I have in our pocket and that we need to share with those people that we know. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for our morning today. What a privilege we have to be in your word to know the truth. We thank you for this divine encounter that you prepared thousands of years ago. You wrote this man's name, this Ethiopian eunuch, in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you prepared this encounter for Philip to meet him and talk to him about Jesus. Pray for each and every one of us that we'll be listening, because we don't know what kind of divine encounter you have prepared for us as we walk along our journey, but we want to listen because it's easy just to drive on to the shoe store and buy your shoes. It's hard to stop and turn around and listen. May we be challenged to be the men and women that you want us to be, especially in 2023, when the world around us is swirling in frustration and people are needing answers. Let us be light and salt in all that we do and say. We love you. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus, our Savior. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.